Thank you very much. And I see that there's no board recognition, so we'll move past um, that to item six. And for anyone who's new to these meetings and it's your first time here, I'll explain that this agenda is a template we use every, every time. We, the board does not vary from this agenda. It, it, it's the same every, every, every time. And so we'll, we'll repeatedly go through. There's packets available on the table at the door if anybody wants to follow along, but it's succinct and classic to every meeting. So now the next thing that we're going to do is item six, and that's committee reports and school reports. Oops, we did skip number three. I'm sorry, and I eagerness to uh, get this going. We need to go back up to three. Um, can I have a motion to accept the agenda? Mm -hmm. In a second. Okay. And I'm not gonna do a roll call. We'll just do um, everyone that, that um, is willing to accept the agenda via the motion, please say aye. Aye. Um, thank you, thanks. Now I'll slow down. And we did attendance and did board recognition. And now we'll go to committee reports and school reports. And we'll start with policy. Policy committee had a very informative and collaborative uh, meeting on Wednesday, the 9th of February, 2022. We discussed and will begin to explore renewing and revising some of our current policies. Um, I think it's important to emphasize that this will be a long legal process, but more importantly, it will give us the opportunity to ensure that our current policies and future policies are looked at carefully through a lens that is less punitive, but is equitable and fair, being very careful to stay within our legal parameters. We discussed the use of a different policy provider and what the long-term benefits and setbacks would be if we were to switch to a different uh, policy provider. And we also um, are going to do a deeper dive and explore how other districts in the state are doing their policy work. Our next meeting is in a few weeks. Thank you very much. And then we'll go to evaluation. Well, the evaluation committee met on Tuesday, the 8th. Um, Dr. Richarder was present, uh, Trustee Shaw Barber, Trustee Harrison, myself, and Susan Comey joined us for the beginning of the meeting. So the first item on the agenda was revisiting the Board of Education informal or informational brochure. It's a project we began before COVID. Um, it's a collection of information about the board, the function of the board, how to contact the board, how to publicly speak at the board meetings, and much more. We all weighed in on it. Um, how to, I'll, I'll show you guys just a quick like a brochure like that with our pictures on it and all the board meeting dates and everything. It's, and um, there are so many more ways to distribute this other than just paper. We can do um, the website. We can even put a QR code on it to connect you with the KPS website. Um, Ms. Coney is going to make a mock-up of it and bring it back to another, bring it back to the committee for a review. And then she left the meeting. And the next subject we talked about was the superintendent evaluation. All school districts in Michigan are charged with the evaluation of their superintendent. At the beginning of the school year, we chose to use the MASB tool in the same process, which is the same process we used last year, and we have the same goals monthly due to COVID. Um, the evaluation process continued in the fall when each board member um, had an informal one-to-one -one conversation with Dr. Richaudry. Another component that was met was the criteria uh, that met the criteria for superintendent evaluation is Dr. Richaudry's district updates, which are through her presentations during board meetings. Um, this winter, the board members have also had the opportunity to ask questions of um, the superintendent to schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings, and those are coming. Uh, the board advance we attended on February 3rd and 4th is a, a more continuation of the evaluation project because we were working towards um, redefining and re rethinking our district goals. Uh, the formal evaluation will take place in the spring with the superintendent providing the board with artifacts that support her work towards the district goals. And then trustees fill in the evaluation tool, we give it back to the evaluation committee, and we compile the data and present it at our last meeting on June 30th. And then the third subject we talked about, um, the possibility of our four trustees evaluations, when we would do that, what it might look like, where to find them, um, review them. And that was the end of our meeting. Our meeting is also next month. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, and so we're through with committee reports and we're moving to correspondence. And then again, it's Trustee Hill. All right, we received several correspondence. There's many ways to get a hold of us besides personal phone calls to us. You can also send um, correspondence through the US mail. You can handle everyone, you can fax, or the most popular is email. So all these came through the email. Um, 127, Shona Espinanza made comments on the board meeting that took place on 127, and then answered her. On 127, Eric and Naomi, I'm going to say this wrong, I apologize, Methens um, emailed us about bus issues, and I answered them. On 127, Amanda Miller um, sent us the KEA board address. And that was very, it's nice if you trust the board, sometimes you can just email us your words so it can get it into the, um, into the agenda. And, and, it, and it's, um, it's a hard copy. And it's easier than us trying to go back and over again. On 127, Sherry Weber emailed us about COVID risk and ventilation data, and I responded. On 127, Matt, 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 made comments on the 127 board. On 129, KPS school about their KPS school account. On 131, we heard from Carly Murphy about COVID-19 and quarantine questions. And oh, and I've answered all these. On 24, we heard from Robert Robin Reed about the AG, that's Attorney General Nessel's opinion. And on um, 24, we heard from Annie Yap, which is virtual commenting at meetings and bipolar ionization in the class. And on 26, we heard from Sherry Butler about public comment accessibility. Oh, I did that name correctly. Oh, oh, okay. Just, just working on the very first person in Chile, and that was Spinoza. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Kelsey Moore. All right, um, that was it. They all had sent emails, and then I respond to them. So thank you very much. Thank you. And um, now we go to item eight, which is the consent count. This is an implied motion. And um, it will not be a roll call vote. All those agreeing to the consent calendar items will just say aye. And on the calendar for this evening is the January 27th regular meeting minutes, purchase request 2226, 2227, 2228, 2229. 2230 and 2231, as well as personnel changes. All those in favor of accepting these items, please say aye. 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 Great, the consent calendar items passed. And now we're going to, as classically we do, a number nine is reports and recommendations, and that's the superintendent's portion of the meeting. So now we hand it over to Dr. Wright for Good evening, everyone, and thank you, President Shoulder Barber. This month, we celebrate the achievements of African Americans and their central role in US history. In addition to special classroom lessons, the KPS Facebook page has a daily spotlight. Pictured on the screen were our posts from the first four days of February. I'd encourage you to visit our Facebook page to see these posts. At our last meeting, I shared this timeline, which shows the process for virtual students who want to request in-person learning for the third and final trimester of this school year. An email was sent on January 28th to all virtual families with a link to the opt-in form. We'll send a second email tomorrow. The deadline is 11 p.m. on February 13th. After the deadline, students will be notified of their in-person school placements before the third trimester begins on March 14th. I again want to remind families that you have 100% choice in moving from virtual to in-person learning during this time frame. Please note that once the choice is made to move to in-person learning by the 13th of February, you are locked in for the rest of the school year. Please choose wisely based on your comfort level with the virus, knowing that things are ever changing. This is the time of year for the letter of intent process to begin. This annual process calls for every current KPS family to indicate their child's school, school, 
their child to be requested school for next year or to choose our fully virtual program. A letter from me, an FAQ document, and this form you see on the screen are being sent by U.S. mail. Please be looking for it to arrive within the next few days. We ask you to complete the form and return it as soon as possible using one of the five ways listed at the bottom of the form. Number one, you can return it to your school's, your student's school. Two, you can send it by U.S. mail to student services at 1220 Howard Street. Three, you can deliver to our drop box on the side of the administration building. Four, you can fax it to 269-337-0169. Or five, take a picture or scan and send it to the email address, KPS letter of intent at kalamazoopublicschools.net. This form helps us verify your current address and secure a spot in KPS for your child or children for the 2022-2023 school year. If you are a current KPS family and do not get a letter soon, please verify that your child's school has your correct mailing address. Let's review the letter of intent timeline. Today, letters were sent by U.S. mail to all current families. For anyone interested in learning more about our virtual programs for students entering kindergarten through grade 12, we will host two virtual information sessions. An email will be sent tomorrow to all KPS families to links to the sessions. The elementary session will be held on Tuesday, February 15th from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. And the secondary virtual information session will be held on February 16th from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. KPS plans to continue to offer the virtual option to families even when this pandemic has ended. On March 10th, a second email will be sent to all families reminding them to submit the letter of intent form if they have not already done so. I will be sharing more information in a few minutes about kindergarten and peak orientation to be held on March 9th. At our next board meeting, I'll update this timeline to reflect what has already happened. We will then send a third email to families on April 1st. Once all of the requests have been received, they are processed by central office and reviewed by principals. The building assignment letters for next school year will be sent on May 9th. For the remainder of the month of May, there is an opportunity to appeal the building assignment or transfer from in-person learning to virtual or vice versa. Once the window for appeals and transfer requests closes, there will be no further movement from in-person to virtual. Just like this year, virtual students will have the opportunity to move to in-person for second and third trimesters. Each of our 17 elementary schools will be hosting a kindergarten and peak or pre-kindergarten orientation on Wednesday, March 9th. The, the morning session will be held virtually at 9.30 a.m. The principal and a kindergarten teacher will be present to share information and answer questions. These virtual sessions will be recorded and posted on the school's websites. After our current elementary students have left for the day, an in-person session will be held at each school beginning at 5.30 p.m. Since as much as possible, additional information about kindergarten, including the links to the virtual sessions will be posted on our website kalamazoopublicschools.com slash kindergarten. Any questions can be directed to our elementary education office at 269-337-0190 or our PEEP office at 269-337-0095. Who is eligible for kindergarten? A child who will be five years old by September 1st may, may enroll in kindergarten for next year. If a child's birthday falls between September 1st and December 1st, and a parent, and as a parent, you feel your child is ready for kindergarten, you may apply for a waiver. All schools in KPS offer full day kindergarten. We follow the same 180 day calendar as the rest of KPS. Students are assigned to schools based on where they live. We also have several magnet schools in KPS that accept students from across the district. Transportation is provided to those schools. And we accept students who live outside of the KPS boundary areas. 
We have an outstanding pre-kindergarten program for students who will be four years old by December 1st. We offer full day and half day classes at most of our elementary schools. Transportation and meals are also provided. We not only believe KPS offers the best educational program in the state, but we are the only district in the nation to have the Kalamazoo Promise Scholarship. By enrolling your child in KPS as a kindergarten student, once they graduate from one of our high schools, they can receive 100% of tuition and mandatory fees at many Michigan post-secondary institutions. If you enter KPS after kindergarten, you will still receive a portion of the Promise Scholarship with continuous enrollment and residency. To enroll in KPS at any grade level for next year, visit our website and click the enrollment link. As a reminder, we are continuing to collaborate with our healthcare partners to continue to offer vaccine clinics. Another vaccine clinic is being hosted on Saturday, February 19th at Millwood Magnet School from 11 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. You must register in advance. At the clinics, Optimet can provide flu shots as well, as well as first or second shots, as well as uh, the COVID-19 boosters for adults and children. We are so proud of our brand new SEL center that we inaugurated last fall. Since then, we have hosted numerous community programs. Our SEL Center is partnering with Integrated Services of Kalamazoo to host a virtual report on ISK's community health needs assessment findings and analysis. The 60-minute presentation will include findings and analysis on inequities in healthcare, gaps in mental health systems, and barriers like racism to equitable community health outcomes. The virtual meeting will be held on February 29th from 4.15 to 5.15 p.m. The link is on the screen. If you need more information, you can call the SEL Center at 269-337-0540. You may learn more about the, uh, about the ISK website at iskcoo.org slash community health needs assessment. One of KPS's three middle school robotics teams accomplished an extraordinary feat. They qualified for the first FTC World Championships held in Houston, Texas, April 20, 20th to April 23rd. Only four teams out of over 400 in Michigan were invited to the World Championship. And only 160 teams in the world will be invited. The team is Zubatic's Linden Grove, which actually consists of 13 students from both Linden Grove and Hillside Middle School. The team is raising funds to cover their expenses. If anyone is able to donate, you may go to the KPS website and look for Rep Track under the Quick Links section on the bottom right. Or you can go directly to the page as at bit.ly slash Worlds. Let's take a quick look at the video. Finally, finish it and it works really well. Probably the tournaments and uh, I mean, they're very stressful, but I mean, especially if you win them, you know, it just it's like incredible feeling, you know. Yeah, I think that was really fun. Um, I found how to work with other people, uh, like how to handle pressure and like how to get through challenges and overcome. Um, I enjoyed building a robot. I enjoyed coming up with the plans. I enjoyed talking with my friends on how to make it. I would say just have fun. Um, you know, it's a fun program. Try to do your best. It's difficult in the beginning, but it gets easier in when you're on board. I like robotics, and uh, I think um, mm -hmm. um, the results show that in the, in the 
being part of math is just so fun. I just love it. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get the roll. Sending our team of 13 kids to five days of concert for $20,000 to airfare, hotels, entry fees, and all that part. Click the link in the description to donate three pounds of food today. This is National School Counselors Week. KPS is fortunate to have dedicated counselors at our secondary schools. Many of them were recently trained in the Applied Suicide Intervention Skills Training or ASSIST. KPS now has 21 employees in our district for ASSIST training. They completed two days of intense training to be ready to respond immediately to any student in a suicidal crisis or with suicidal ideation. The training included helping students and their families to develop a safe plan. Our school counselors also have a tremendous impact helping students achieve academically in school and planning for post-secondary success. School districts implement benchmark assessments to measure student proficiency in reading and mathematics. School districts administer these benchmark assessments within the first five weeks of the year and again prior to the last day of the school year. Data from the assessments are intended to measure meaningful progress towards mastery of grade level content standards. We are reporting on these data now and we'll report on them again at the end of the school year in June. And board members, you do have a copy of this data that I'm about to share for your reference. Our goal for high school students is that they will successfully complete 13 out of 15 classes during the school year. Successfully, earn, successfully earning credit in 13 courses would indicate that students are on track for on-time high school graduation. On-track measure is a new concept that we introduced to KPS this year that comes out of research done at the University of Chicago. It allows us to monitor student progress early and often, and as a result, support our students before it's too late. We're building the capacity of our, our adults in our schools to implement strategies around on-track metrics. Although benchmark reporting is done from one year to the next, this slide compares 2019 student course success to 2021. We chose 2019 because we have high expectations of ourselves and we wanted to compare this year to a pre-COVID year, although we are still dealing with COVID trauma and learning loss. In reviewing this data, we are very proud of the success of our 12th graders and their teachers and know that this will continue. This slide compares the race and ethnicity subgroup performance in all of our high schools. While we see a discrepancy between subgroups, it is encouraging to see that students are attaining more credits across all subgroups than they did in 2019. Consistent with pre-COVID assessments in our district, our third to eighth graders participated in the NWEA map assessment in reading and math. NWEA conducted a research study on the impact of COVID disruptions on student performance. They looked at each state and created a predictive model for the expected learning loss. This graph represents the expected performance of students on the reading assessment in light green, and their actual performance in dark green. Each bar represents the percentage of students that are scoring at or above grade level. District-wide, our beginning of the year student performance was consistent with the predictions from NWEA research. This graph represents the same third to eighth grade students from the previous slide, broken down by student subgroups. Across most of our subgroups, our students have had more loss than predicted. We understand that student learning loss is exacerbated by factors that our district faced with a high degree of poverty, trauma from COVID-related stress, um, and, and which was more so than other districts in the state. Remember, these predictions were statewide and not tailored to high poverty large urban school districts such as ours. While we are seeing lower than expected performance because of COVID-related factors in most subgroups, 
We do want to celebrate the fact that our English language learners and students with IPs are doing better than their expected performance. This graph represents the expected performance of students on the math assessment in light purple and their actual performance in dark purple. District-wide, our beginning of the year student performance was consistent with the predictions from NWEA research. While there was some variation in the younger grades, we expected reduced performance in math because of extended online learning, having more significant impact on foundational math skills. This graph represents the expected NWEA performance and actual performance of our subgroup populations on the math assessment. Students are performing close to or at, or at expected performance in math across all subgroups. Once again, we are happy to see our English language learners and students with disabilities performing at a higher rate than expected. This year, we adjusted the assessment used in kindergarten through second grade to fast bridge. Consequently, we do not have comparison data. This slide shows the percentage of students in reading represented by the green bars that are scoring at or above grade level. The purple bars represent the percentage of students that are performing at grade level in math. It is important to remember, this is the first time these students are in in-person school for a full calendar year, and they are new to taking assessments. This slide breaks down the K-2 performance by subgroup. Remembering again that this is the first time that students have been, have ever, that these particular students have ever been in school in person. This demonstrates the proficiency of students as they enter school. These slides are a snapshot of student performance when they took their beginning of the year assessments. This baseline data helps our teachers and school leaders as they plan instruction to meet the needs of all of our students. We revisit our goals of improving student performance regularly in the district, and we will report at the end of the year on student progress. Curriculum and relevant coursework has a huge impact on student success. Tonight, we will have the second reading of the course bulletin changes for the 2022-2023 school year, culminating in a board vote to accept these recommendations. In conversations with the Board of Education, three themes continue to surface around board priorities and what the board wanted me, the new superintendent, this is last year, still hasn't changed um, um, what I was um, asked to focus on. The core of it was college and career readiness for all of our students. How do we get there? We get there by focusing on equity and access and by the removal of artificial barriers, by enhancing rigor and by implementing quality programs and by providing enhanced choice and opportunity to our students. My course recommendations to the board this evening is one of many ways we will achieve equity, rigor, and choice to move towards the ultimate goal of preparing our students for success in college, career, and life. These are the middle school recommendations. First, the addition of Future Proud Michigan Education Course 1 and 2. The Future Proud Michigan Educator courses are designed to provide students opportunities to explore the teaching profession and what makes a healthy learning environment. These courses closely align with the college and career theme of equity as part of KPS's effort to grow our own teachers to meet our staffing needs and increase the percentage of teachers of color. Second, change the description of the Digital Imaging 6 course to align with the courses that are offered to the seventh and eighth grade students. This aligns with the theme of choice and allows for the flexibility of all middle grades to take this course. Third, delete the music technology and percussion and ensemble classes that were offered at Millwood Magnet. Millwood Magnet does not have the staff to teach these specialty music courses. This change is related to the college and career theme of rigor as it allows for a greater focus on the band and orchestra program. For high schools, we are recommending the expansion of the geology course from one trimester to two trimesters where students can earn a full credit in geology. The course will include a thorough exploration of the career opportunities in the geological sciences 
and students have the opportunity to learn to earn college credit if they pass the final exam. Currently, 12 Michigan University, currently we have worked with 12 Michigan universities to accept the geology credit. The expansion of this course is most closely related to the theme of rigor by providing opportunities to acquire college level credit and choice by providing students the opportunity to explore careers in the geosciences. We are also recommending revising the African World Studies course curriculum. Writers will infuse African American literature resources and opportunities for students to learn about the and create visual and performing applied arts or VPAA projects that showcase what they have learned. The additional content will allow English language arts and VPAA certified teachers to be instructors for this course. This will also allow the African American Studies course to count as electives in ELA, which is English Language Arts, Social Studies, and Visual and Performing Arts, and provide students choice in how they apply this credit. The changes are closely related to the theme of equity by bringing about greater flexibility to implement this course, particularly at Phoenix High School, where scheduling and the Visual and Performing Arts electives are difficult to offer due to their smaller staff. The final recommendation for high schools is the addition of the Future Proud Michigan Educators course pre. In this third course, students will learn about the skills it takes to be successful in education and will include a clinical experience at the middle school or elementary level. This class is geared towards ninth and 10th graders and will prepare them for success in the Teacher Academy CTE course. In addition to the theme of equity, the High School Future Proud Michigan Educators course is related to the college and career themes of choice. This course will be designed to prepare students for a career in education and will also give, give our students and train them for the opportunities to apply the skills they have learned as tutors or staff members during our summer program. President Schuller Barber, please call for a motion and vote to adopt the course bulletin recommendation. Thank you. Um, do I have a motion to adopt the middle and high school course and program recommendations for 2022-23? So Thank you. I have a motion from Trustee Hill. Do I have a second? Second. And I have a second from Trustee Mack. What we're voting on is to accept the middle and high school course and program re recommendations for 2022-23. 20, this will be a roll call vote. We'll start with Trustee Hill. Yes. Trustee Harrison. Yes. Trustee Maynard. Yes. And Trustee Moore. Yes. And I vote yes. So it passes unanimously that we accept the program recommendations for middle and high school courses for the academic year 2022 and 23. Thank you, trustees, for accepting my recommendation. Our next report will be given by our Director of Technology Systems and Services. Mr. Ian Hay. Thank you, Dr. Tucker. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about E-rate funding. Um, this is a federal program by the FCC. Um, it's implemented about 25 years ago to help schools and public libraries obtain affordable internet. Um, when it was implemented, about 15% of the districts in the US had internet access and the uh, cost was the major factor there. Um, so the FCC has made funding available for us in two different categories. Um, the first one is how we get internet to our buildings. So KBS owns about 100 miles of fiber optic cable that we run between our buildings. Um, and that's what that category one covers. Luckily, um, we are eligible for a maximum reimbursement of 90% based off of our free and reduced numbers. So anything we spend on that, E-rate will reimburse us 90% of that. Um, that one has no, no budget or allotment, it's deep-based. Category two is a little bit different. Um, this is the equipment to get internet access from our buildings uh, to our classrooms. So our switches, our access points, which the, the big white box on the ceiling there, that's a wireless access point that's shooting Wi-Fi throughout the room. Um, that is category two for us. Uh, we are, that one has an 85% maximum, which again, we are, we're eligible for, which is great. We only pay 15% of the equipment costs there. That one is done in a five-year cycle. Um, we are starting year two of this five-year cycle. Um, in that five-year cycle, we have been allotted about $2.2 million. Um, 
if we use all of that $2.2 million, our true cost of that is only $330,000, um, which, which is amazing. We can get top-notch equipment to make sure our kids have access to the internet throughout all of our buildings. Because um, keep in mind, we have over 20,000 devices connected to the internet, um, and we need a, a really solid infrastructure to keep that going. So for $330,000, um, that's quite a deal. So we actually just passed a purchase requisition for year two on here, the, the access points. We're looking to replace 300 of our secondary access points um, that we purchased in 2016. They're just aging out at this point. Um, and we're adding 200 to the elementary building. Those were done in 2018, but at that time, we didn't have as many Chromebooks um, in, in the buildings. So one access point covered multiple rooms. Um, so it's, and it, it's kind of gotten to the point now where our device density is really, it's uh, surpassed our capacity for wireless there. So by adding these 200 access points, every room will have their own access point to, to cover everybody in that classroom. Um, so that's what's gonna happen this summer. Uh, year three of this program, this, this five-year cycle, um, we're going to do our switches and our power supplies um, for the secondary and our battery backups there. Those were uh, purchased in 2016 and again, just aging out by that point. Um, year four is going to be the access points in the elementaries that were done in 2018. Year five, um, the best of that $2.2 million cycle will be the switches and power supplies for the elementary that were also in 2018. Um, we don't have to spend this this entire amount, and we don't have to do it all in one year. I like to spread it out so that we can kind of plan and get on a nice cycle. Um, but then that next year, that fiscal year 25, 26, um, we'll start a new cycle with, it's estimated at this point, but likely another 2.2-ish million dollars. Um, so we'll always have just top-notch internet access for all of our buildings and classrooms. Okay. Any questions about that? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So let's now have a discussion or if there are any questions from the board. Trustee Harrison. I do have a question. Um, wanted to know, is the city keeping up with the infrastructure work at the same rate that we're doing? I, I noticed that you said we have 100 miles of cable, and I think that's really great. But if we're doing all this work, are we able, are, are, if we're doing this work on the inside, is the city doing the same amount of work on the outside? A good question. Um, the city is not eligible for that same E rate. That's only school districts and public libraries. So anything they're doing on their own is the city funds that they have to do that. So um, they're likely only running cables between their buildings. Uh, residential access is going to be your Spectrums, um, Comcast, companies like that. Um, that's who's going to be running that fiber throughout the city. And so in regards to uh, our students that are virtual, how does that help them? Um, so this actually came up with the FCC. People asked and said, hey, now that we're virtual, it does internet access for these home students have any, any impact on this? And the ruling basically came back and said, the way the laws were written, no, it does not. It is only strictly for buildings that have students in them. Um, so things like our stock room, um, that wouldn't qualify because we don't have students stationed in that building. So students at home in our virtual programs are not covered by that. However, we do have a partnership with KPL and with the city to offer hotspots for students that don't have adequate internet access at home. And I think it's important to note that this E-rate program also wouldn't cover a building such as this one because we don't have students in here. So we have 35 buildings um, that KPS owns. 24 of those 35 buildings are school buildings. They will just cover if the, if the 100 miles of cable would, uh, is, it runs between those buildings. They won't cover that. So it's very restrictive in, in how these funds can be used. I would just like to do a tandem on, on your question, Trustee Harrison. Uh, Mr. Hay, and it's a pleasure to meet you. I, I've not met you before, but welcome. I'm, I'm so pleased to see you here. But to Trustee Harrison's question, is this an issue between, and I, I, I certainly understand what you're saying about students in the building and that these funds are germane to students, but her question is well put. So is that a public versus a private? Like, like when we're getting into the neighborhoods, that's a private entity. The city can do with their buildings, but as far as in the neighborhoods, is that... Explain that to me. Yeah, so that is that is all private infrastructure there. A lot of it is funded with federal funds, um, but it is private entities, private companies laying that fiber. 
So, so the the city does the city lay fiber? I would assume between their own buildings, yes. um, because the cost of leasing it from a private company is way too expensive. Sure. But I would believe between their own buildings, they do yes. So, so our it, it's a challenge to trustees Harrison's point. It's a challenge if you're in a neighborhood that does not have that the the private entities are not supplying or laying that that fiber optic cable or whatever. Yep. So our challenge is to motivate for that. Yeah, so as tech directors around the state, we've advocated with our state MDE kind of E-rate uh, person there. His name is Joe Plaschick. He does a great job for us. And then he advocates for us at the national level to try to get some of these rules changed. And they did actually, so the E-rate program wasn't affected, but they did open up. And I've seen this on, you know, I think you put this out. I've seen this on Facebook, people talking about it. Um, the same program, same FCC kind of program, did allow for um, either free or very, very reduced cost internet um, for our families. Um, and actually, I believe everybody here qualified because we are all on the free and reduced um, community eligibility provision for that. It's and still your floor. I just, just that was a, a question off your question. So, Trustee Harrison, and I can and then, add, maybe I can add some, yeah. some more information to um, Trustee Harrison's question. So KPS also sits on the um, the FFC um, uh, the the, the DAPA program that got started, the digital access for all program that got started as a partnership between KPS, um, the Columns of Public Libraries, the, the Promise, Columns of Community Foundation, and FFC, which is the um, Foundation for Excellence, which is the city's foundation. This is something that we are discussing. Um, in that group uh, to, to see if private funding that is going to the city can be utilized to motivate some of these um, private companies. Uh, but as Ian pointed out, it is still um, private companies that they they may be um, influenced. So it is something that KPS is involved in and that we're working on. And, and just to kind of um, clarify what I'm trying to say, I think that it's great if you can have free and reduced cost internet, but what does it mean if you can't access it, it doesn't matter that I get free internet if I can't use the internet in my neighborhood, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So just wanted you to advocate and, and with that kind of, of lens, like it's great that there's free and reduced and all those things are great, but if you can't access it in your home, what does it really mean? Thank you. Is it, are there more questions? Any, anyone else? No, I, I really, it, it, for me, and I really, I think Trustee Harrison brings up a good point that, that we all witness that it, it's a private versus public game and, and where they build the towers, where they like lay the fiber optic. If I'm, Mr. Hate, if I'm correct in assuming that we have little control over that to a point, that this is not exactly. So um, I, I really thank you very much and thanks you for advocating and, and all the way up to the MDE. Flasher, did you say his last name? Palasher. A Palasher. Um, thank him for advocating for our students because until we can mount that barrier to the point that was made. So thank you very much. This is, and thank you very much for presenting that to us. Very important. Anything else? Okay. Um, so Dr. Wright Chaudhuri, is there any more to your that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so now we go to, as we do every uh, meeting, number 10 is persons requesting to address the board. This is hugely important and very um, uh, serious. And I would just like to point out that it is a monologue for, this isn't a, dis this isn't a dialogue between the board. But it, the board listens very intently and very purposely. Many of the comments that are made at the mic will come up at meetings. They'll, some some um, people that come to the mic will get calls from various administrators the next day. This is not a uh, acting futility. It, you are being heard. Um, we do have limits as far as the board goes. We have a lane that we stay in. We're not micromanaging buildings, but we are listening. I don't do this very often, but tonight I'm going to refresh and read in. And, and I've never had anyone do bells when I start speaking. So thank you. 
Thank you so much. I feel like this is a little bit more celebratory. Thank you so much. Um, Trustee Maynard and I are a team, so I just want you to know that. Thank you so much. Okay, so here we are. The policy is, while balancing legitimate privacy interests of students and staff, the Board of Trustees welcomes, and I want to underline that, community input at public meetings of the Board of Trustees. And I'll just do a little caveat here. This is germane to, I would say, 99.9% of the boards of all types. This is, this is very much how this section goes. Persons requesting to address the board will be asked to complete a sign-in sheet by the end of the public comment period. The portion of that sign-in sheet requiring completion will include name, school district in which the person resides, connection to or interest in the Kalamazoo Public Schools. The optional portion will be held private and will include mailing address, email address, phone number, topic which they will be speaking about, and if authorized or applicable, the organization they represent. This is this that that optional part is kept very private. The presiding office will invite persons to come to the podium in order in which this that they sign in the, the sheet completed. If after 30 minutes, everyone who has completed a sign and she has not had the opportunity to address the board, the public comment period will be tabled and resumed before adjournment. Speakers have three minutes each and must stop speaking promptly when signaled. Uh, we have a little demonstration of the signal from Trustee Maida. Uh, no, 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 oh, no, no, oh, no. We're humans, we're humans. Okay. <laughs> speakers may not address confidential student or personal matters. And I really want to stress that speakers may not address confidential student or personal matters, but may submit such concerns to the board in writing. Um, that includes, um, yeah, I have a note here that um, that also includes any kind of personnel situation. So uh, we should add it confidential student and personnel and emphasize that. Okay, so we're going to number six. Speakers are encouraged to provide the board with a written copy of their comments and other appropriate supporting documentation, which will be copied and distributed as needed to the appropriate staff and personnel. To my point I made earlier, that many times this information disseminates through when it gets to the right department and whatever, or these questions um, get distributed. The public is required to exercise common courtesy during the meeting. In today's world, let's emphasize the common courtesy. It must follow the rule of order. The presiding board officer may terminate public comments that are profane, vulgar, or defamatory, especially if these comments are result in a disturbance or breach of the peace. Personal attacks against any employee or board member that are totally unrelated to his or her duties are prohibited. If a person engages in disruptive conduct or is out of order, the board presiding officer will strike her gavel and warn the person to just discontinue their behavior. Further disruptions will result in a person being asked to leave. Refusal to leave will result in being escorted out of the building. This is the last adoption of this was in December 19. My last editorial comment here is I am so pleased to say we have many comments from the from the mic and we welcome them. But our public is using incredible decorum and using the same standards we expect in our classroom. The respect and the civility is, is very appreciated by the board. With that, let's get to our first person. And that is... Cynthia Whittingham and Gary Mark. Hi, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for... Um, I think okay. My name is Cynthia Whittingham, and I'm a uh, resident and a council public school by three children, the graduator from Lloyd Art High School. But I'm here today as a representative of the Stewart uh, Area Restoration Association, which is the name of our neighborhood association. This is? I'm Gary Mark. I live in the Stewart area. Uh, um, also belong to the, the board. 
Yeah, he has two kids that graduated from Central and one that's still there. So. Okay. So anyway, the reason we're here today is because uh, you know, one of the goals of our neighborhood association is to support the Woodward School, which is in our neighborhood. And so in, in that effort, what have we done in the past is we've made some donations. People have made donations like around the holidays. What we're uh, looking at is we're looking at trying to do more. And one of the things, since one of our goals is uh, to support the the historic nature of our neighborhood. Of course, Woodward School was 100 years old. The oldest part of the school was 100 years old in 2021. We hope to do a celebration with the 100th day of school, but that because of the COVID and all, and all that, that never happened. But anyway, we'd still like to do that. But what we're thinking about is um, Mr. Rocco, the principal there, has talked with us several times about how he would like to have the clock, if you're familiar with that school building, the clock uh, restored. And uh, we've looked into the cost of what that would be. But we're also concerned, we hear rumors that possibly Woodward School is going to be closed. And those rumors have been circulated for a couple of years now. And so before we would endeavor to uh, make a, ask for a collaboration with KPS and with funders in the community that we would we want to feel like there's some uh, we want to know you don't have to tell us right now but we want to know we we want to, to work on this and raise money and get it fixed and we looked into that already but we don't want to do it if the building's going to be sold in two years so I guess flat out that's kind of where we're coming from. But we, we do intend to continue to try and support the school. And Mr. Rocco has come to some of our meetings and he's very easy and collaborative to, to deal with. He's recently joined our, our board so that we have a, a liaison with. It's helped out quite a bit. So um, we just like to do whatever we can help the Woodward School be. The neighborhood is very attached to the school. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Faye Thomas. My name is Faye Thomas. I am a senior at Boyd Oaks High School. I've chosen to come speak today to call out the district's incompetence. The KPS administration is failing, failing us. Personally, I'm sick of being treated like a, the students do not understand the problems of the district. We understand and we see what you guys are doing. We are young adults when it benefits your actions and then we are children when we criticize them. I'm sick of the double standard, personally. There are videos of our administrative, of one of our administrators body slamming a child, breaking up a fight. I won't say his name for sake of privacy, but we all know who did it. And there has been no response from the district publicly to the students. That is not okay. He was admitted to the hospital. Why have we accepted as a district that this is acceptable behavior? The acts of violence from administration extend beyond the physical harm of our students. You hide behind favorites quotes from Admiral K. Jr. and Rosa Parks, but turn right back around and silence students' concerns about the institutionalized racism in our district. We are being told by our schools that there is a right way to complain. We reach out to you by email and are met with silence. We reach out to our teachers and our administrators at our schools and are met with silence. We are, <clears throat> the district has zero transparency with the actual COVID numbers. We all know people are getting sick. Our teachers, our family, our peers, and our friends are getting sick. Senior my age died from COVID-19 after fighting for her life for two months. The district has not hold, held any sort of visual or remembrance for her with a nine-year-old student dying in the exact same week. 
He fought for her life for two months. That's really sad. We are dying and we are being abandoned by the people who are supposed to protect us. With all of this in mind, you threaten our teachers, refusing to work with their union and honor their contracts. Back before the school year even started, you threatened to sue them if they did not return to in-person learning. This is coming from the teachers themselves. Um, how dare you put so much pressure on the, on the people educating the minds of tomorrow and then turn around and beat them down continuously. The last thing I would like to mention here today is I am ashamed of our leaders. I am ashamed of leaving my brothers in a district that won't fight for them. I'm ashamed of our elected officials. I'm able to vote in the next election. I will not be voting for most of you. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Darren. Yeah, you're fine. Good evening. My name is Darren Spurdy. I'm a senior at Loy Norix High School. And today I've decided to speak out just as many have before on the failures and fundamental contradictions of this administration. You constantly virtue signal and claim to support student voices while simultaneously curving the ladder at every turn. When we decided to protest on MLK Day, you tried to stop it, barring further students from leaving and to be heard. Then if that wasn't bad already, the administrators at Norix and KC instead of listening to their student body, as they supposedly care about doing, uh, instead created more harm by initially barring students into, uh, into coming back to the building in the freezing cold, which I might add, mo uh, a lot of the, their parents and students have to pay to keep open. All while the latter is happening, this administration goes on Facebook and post quotes from Dr. King, as if somehow Dr. King would support an administration that doesn't take care or listen to the grievances of its students. When it comes to COVID, you consistently failed to address the spread of COVID within KPS schools, and you've put people at risk, enough so that two students died. Two students would be alive if this administration took COVID more seriously. And when it comes to teachers, you have made barriers to prevent them from speaking out and conveying their grievances by holding their positions and jobs on the cutting line if they speak out without your approval at walkouts. The very fact that I and everyone else here has only three minutes to speak and that there is no Q&A or town hall for issues consistently brought to, brought to the attention of the board proves that you do not care about hearing from students, teachers, and parents. You should all be ashamed. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Amanda Miller. Good evening, trustees, Dr. Rachel Dree, and community. My name is Amanda Miller. I serve as the KEA president for the teachers union. Thanks for the opportunity to speak tonight. At the last meeting, I spoke to you about the burnout that's happening in the schools due to lack of staff and additional workload that comes along with that. I also shared a list of items that KEA would like to see implemented and as soon as possible. One thing on the list is to remove work from the plates of staff to lessen their load during this time. The parties have begun looking at this to help retain staff and improve morale. The parties have set a date to discuss other COVID relief. The KEA would like to, like KPS, to consider increasing compensation for staff who are subbing for colleagues, add sick time for COVID use, and the possibility of remote work whenever feasible. The KEA has shared with the district, the surrounding districts who currently do this, as a few KEA members are getting close to running out or have run out of sick days. This should not be a current worry on staff's minds. These types of things would go far in retaining staff and increasing morale. The KEA is also looking at the possibility of a more sustainable schedule. For example, other districts have early release days and have meetings after the students release. This saves staff from having to complete numerous hours of meetings after hours. This occurs in surrounding districts and staff report that it provides them with some relief 
as well as some time to collaborate with their colleagues. This type of change would also go far in retaining staff and increasing morale. The KE appreciated Mr. English's presentation regarding the need for KPS to be more innovative and to compensate staff better, especially for going above and beyond the normal scope of their jobs. It seems our objectives are almost are mostly aligned in this area, and that is a good sign. We need COVID relief right now. KPS could post and hire contractual subs under the KEA contract. These workers would have benefits and a living wage. This type of measure can and should be implemented as soon as possible, using non-recurring funds like ESSER 3 funds to get us through the pandemic and lessen some of the burden. KEA believes this measure would go very far in help, helping with retention and increasing morale. Last time, I invited you to come to the classrooms and see for yourself what's going on in the district. I am unaware if any of you have done this, but I urge you to do so. Please, this is urgent. Act now. Help us move these things along as soon and as quickly as we possibly can. There's no really no time to spare. Thank you. Thank you. And the last person to speak is Magic D. I respectfully decline. I'm sorry. I decline to speak Thank tonight. You. Thank you very much. And seeing no other um, uh, participants at the mic, we'll close that session. And um, I see that there's no other business. President Charles Robert, can we do the business and financial reports? In the consent calendar? We already. Oh, yeah. we did those? We already approved those. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Oh, yeah, 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 that was all in the consent calendar. May I? Yes, yes, trustee Moore. Really quick, um, since we did not get a chance to go through the purchasing or the purchase recommendations, I really want to know what chillers are. Thank you. Can anyone tell me about chiller equipment? Um, I think there's someone in the room who knows chillers pretty up close and personal. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, if with Dr. Wright uh, your permission, I'll call on Ms. Jackson. Could you give us a chiller update? Chiller 101. It provides the air conditioning. All of the is essential. So it's just air conditioning. Okay, I've not not heard it called chiller equipment. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> They, and, and every time we educate ourselves and the public, it's all good. It, it's all good. So thank you, Ms. Jackson, for, and oftentimes there are words and phrases that someone knows, but it's not. A, there you go. There you go. And and we've seen it often in Don proposals. So I think clarification is, is totally appropriate. Okay. So seeing no more questions, we'll go to see no other business. Now we're going to comment by um, the trustees and superintendent. And does anyone want to start? This is so like a classroom. I'm going to put their head down. I get no eye contact. Could this be a stare down with you people? I'm not sure, but okay. Trustee Hill, here's the heroine for sure. All right, I just want to um, thank the district and all the heads that are making me feel so good about the changes to the course catalog. Um, I've been here for 11 years and I see how the courses morph to what is needed in the world today. So I'm feeling good about our future educators, our Young Teachers Academy. Um, I think it speaks for itself because who knows the students better than the students that are coming back to teach the students. So I think that's very important. I'm also a big fan of science, so I like the programs that support sciences and that you can get college credits for them. And I'm really psyched about CPE. After our meeting, um, Trustee Shala Barber and I headed on over to the Hair Zoo because Theresa had a um, open house. And I can't even begin to describe how many classes were there. Um, I'm a, how many different offerings, you know, anything from bakery to, to um, hair, um, hair services, to medicine, to geology. They were just all, it was amazing. And, there, and the place was packed, and we got there at 7 o'clock in the evening and ended at 7.30. So I was very impressed. 800 people were there. I just got a note from Trustee Shaw Barber. Um, yes, so that was a huge evening. So I just want to give a shout out to the Teresa for a nicely run program. 
Um, nice way to get people motivated about their futures, which make people more engaged in school. And then we all can supply workers because we know there's a working shortage of everything. Thank you. Thank you. And let's go to Trustee Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'm sorry, I neglected to chime in at the end of uh, Dr. Rashadri's report. Um, so I just wanted to comment really quick um, that I think that all of us would be disappointed with the lower growth rate among non-white students between the last couple of years. And I'm wondering if, if we can expect any sort of report or if you could present to the board, maybe you know, tell us what, what we have learned in this past year, what we are going to do differently to see, to see that increase. Um, in the next school year. So the next time we're looking at these charts. Um, um, I think the second thing that I wanted to talk about was the air quality um, evaluation or audit that we discussed before. Um, just wanted to know if that is something that we can expect. Um, maybe you don't have the answer right now, but I want to put it on the radar um, again, because I know that it has been brought up several times that folks are asking or uh, an evaluation or an audit of the equipment that we are using now. Um, and I still haven't heard whether that's something if we are taking these sort of measurements at regular intervals or if there is something in progress um, that we can expect to see and that folks have been asking and would really appreciate knowing at least that it's coming um, and having that, that answer. Um, aside from that, uh, I think that I want to echo Darren's um, Thank you. Comment about uh, town hall forums. Um, this is something that we said we would do um, before. Uh, was it a year, two years ago, um, that we, you know, revised our policy and we talked about board forums and holding board forums. And that's, you know, that's something that we would host. Um, we would take Q and A's. I think that that would be really, really beneficial um, to everyone in the community and, in particular, right now to students. I think that um, if if this administration is feeling misunderstood um, with some of the feedback that they're getting from students, this is an opportunity, um, you know, to explain ourselves. And I think that we need to uh, put ourselves on the hot seat and, and talk through it. Oh, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Trustee Harris. Um, wanted to say congratulations to the robotics team. I think that it's really impressive that they are one of four teams in Michigan. Um, to have the honor of going to the conference and hope that they are able to successfully raise the funds that they need to get there. Uh, would love to, um, I'm not, I understand that the programs are offered in the schools. Wanted to know um, if there was ever any talk about expanding them into the neighborhood hubs so that more students would be able to participate. Wanted to also ask a couple of questions about how um, the recruitment process is done, how students are uh, made aware of the opportunity to participate in that program. Also wanted to ask a few questions about the benchmark data um, presentation that we got and understanding that there has been a tremendous amount of learning loss as a result of COVID disruption among our black and brown students, but just wanted to learn a little bit more about why the expectations are set so low to begin with, and then what efforts are in place to improve this? How are we reaching the students? Because um, it's kind of disheartening that we're measuring, that the expectation that we have for our black and brown students is a third of that of that we have for our non-black and brown students. And, um, wanted to think that's right. Okay, um, Trustee Maida. All right. <clears throat> uh, real quick, uh, to Trustee or Vice President Harrison's point, I think that the the expectation set as far as like the map scores, um, they are set not by the district, but they're set by like the of the national assessment, um, but I totally, I absolutely agree that there, there's got to be, you know, there, there's an issue that I take with why the bar is set so low to begin with. Um, but I just want to make sure I clarify that that wasn't necessarily set by the district themselves. Um, let's see. Oh, I guess I had a question, and this is mostly just for port protocol. But do we use 
few questions like after Dr. Aitodri's presentation. And I think sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. So the majority of my comments are just about the presentation. And I think, and the chair, chair will say there are times, depending on the report, where we stop and depending on the cadence and whatever, but I'll make a decided effort now that you raised the question. After Dr. Raichaduri's presentation, before we move to subsequent topics, we'll stop and collate questions and discuss it at that moment. But it's also very appropriate at this time to ask questions. Okay. That that's not inappropriate. Perfect. Just wanted to clarify and make sure I was on the right page. Uh, I was wondering if I could just ask a question about the SDL Center and the ISK presentation, because we definitely want to be able to tune into that. Um, on the presentation, I noticed it said it was February 28th, but in my head, I think I heard the 29th. So I just wanted to clarify the date. Um, yes, I think it's the 28th. The 28th. Okay, the 28th. so it's on. Um, happy Calculator Appreciation Week. I have some friends who are school counselors, and I definitely understand how huge of a workload you take on, whether it's like scheduling and providing mental health supports. Uh, I'm really grateful for those that volunteered their extra time to be trained in the suicide prevention program with the assist. Um, you know, I, I personally have not been affected, but I have people I really care about who have been affected with loved ones who have been lost to suicide. And so I know just how important it is that we have somebody in every single school who's there to recognize the signs and to provide support for students and their mental health. Um, regarding the benchmark assessment, similar to other trustees who have commented on the clear discrepancy in success rates for students of color, um, that obviously needs to and is being addressed. I am really pleased to see how the scores have improved for students with special needs and English language learners. Um, so really grateful to all of the gen ed teachers, special ed teachers, and the paraprofessionals supporting those students, especially during such a really difficult time of COVID, like virtual learning. I, it's really interesting, and I'm curious, like, what supports and services have increased or changed or modifications have been used to help students increase those scores and find greater success? Um, let's see. Oh, the courses that uh, we voted to approve. I just wanted to reiterate my love for the addition of the middle school and the high school uh, education courses uh, to provide some early intervention for students to pursue a career in education. Uh, regarding the geology courses, this is just a little side note uh, for any students that really enjoy this topic. The Kalamazoo Expo Center has a really cool rock, gem, and mineral show that they do a couple times a year. Uh, I've been a couple times. It's very neat. Um, and then really just the last thing I had was, uh, this is the second meeting in a row now where students have come to speak. Um, and I am really, I am really grateful to see students being involved in what's going on. And, you know, they're, they're paying attention to what things are happening around them and sharing their perspective. And I, I greatly appreciate that because I know when I was in high school, I wasn't necessarily as involved in, you know, things going on in my community and in my schools. Um, so just keep coming. I'd love to hear from you. That's all I have. Thank you. Um, so now I'll go. And um, I, too, every time a student comes to that mic from a social studies, a retired out of the classroom for several years now, social studies teacher, you teach civic engagement. You teach participation. You teach free speech. You teach um, voicing your opinion. You, you teach those things. And so when you see children learning that concept and coming forward, it is just really, no matter what it is, they can be pleased, they can be displeased. So goes America. But the fact that they took the time and they came and they, they do speak is, is a step in the right direction. It is it's public discourse. And again, to a social studies heart, a social studies teacher's heart, you like I said, you teach civic engagement. And and so I I um 
um, pleased to see when we have students speak. Um, I think uh, the next thing I want to do is make a clarification on Zubatic. Trustee Reichhofer, could you explain this program and, and what this, this is about, please? Sure. Zubatics is a club uh, mainly run by parents of um, our students, and KPS supports programs such as this uh, by providing space uh, mentorship. And of course, we are now promoting um, their subsequent um, wins um, and them uh, advancing to the world championship. Trustee Harrison. Just to be clear, I understand that it's a club. I was asking more about how do we expand the opportunity. Thank you. Good point of clarification. Good. Thank you. Thank you. So um, as we're learning about chillers, we're learning about clubs and participation. Um, I would also like to um, do a giant, an absolute, I can't even be enthused enough about this musical at Loyne Arc, Something Rotten. It is being a, a, a tremendous fan of musical theater and seeing many, many productions. Having spent 36 years in high schools, I've seen a lot of musicals. This is probably the top five musicals I have ever seen. The quality of, of um, the quality of this production, and we can go to the choreographer, we can go to the set design, we can go to um, the musical director. It is amazing. It is amazing. This weekend, it will be on, I think, both Friday and Saturday and Sunday afternoon. Please check the website, Lloyd Hart's website, Something Rotten. It is hysterical. The quality of some of these um, young students, the voices, the quality of acting is beyond. Uh, you are missing a great opportunity if you don't attend this musical. It's uh, and, and KPS is there. Um, Kasdorf Auditorium, which if anyone has any history in the district, Tom Kasdorf did amazing work. This is the fitting of this auditorium at Loin Oryx. Um, I can't even, I, I don't even know how much more enthused or it was a great, um, a great experience. So thank you to everyone, directors, students, parents, and there's a lot of, to robotics and to the carpool people and whatever. The people who support KPS and our students that resonated through this production. So on the back side of that, um, there is some, we've all heard, there's legislation pending in many states and in many areas of the country that are aimed at teachers or the worker or, or various aspects of. This is not a political platform. I'm only saying, please be aware when you are voting and when you're assessing these things, such that you're voting for people who are supporting public education and supporting our many, many, many dedicated, dedicated. Um, when I go to early meetings, um, i driving by schools, there's cars in our parking lots at 7.01 when the building doesn't commence till maybe 8.30, quarter to nine. I drive by for a late evening meeting and I see School dismissal was at 2.30. There's still many cars in the parking lot at 4.35 o'clock, 6 o'clock. So the dedication and the complexity of this is really important. So back to my original statement, please be aware and read carefully and make sure you're supporting and really our, our, our presentation two weeks ago from Mr. English about people not going into this profession with legislation that is pending in some states, in some locales, you'd scratch your head to think, why would you? Why would you? And that cannot happen. It's a pillar of a democratic society. We have brilliant, brilliant educators in KBS. So I, I beg you to be informed and please, please support um, our, our um, educators and, and the people who support them. Um, I think that I'd like to do a shout out about clubs. The Boys and Girls Club is just about to their $9 million goal. They are a good partner of ours. They are a brilliant partner of ours. We cannot do the work that Boys and Girls Club does. We, we have to. Our teachers must go home. That doesn't mean our students' needs are, are encapsulated at that time. Boys and Girls Club steps in. So if you can find, go to their website and um, please, please donate. This is something that is 
brilliant and very much a part of this community and this new center, which will be on Porter Street, a little bit down from Lowe's and Fishes, um, close to some, some neighborhoods that would use this. And it's going to be a brilliant facility. So I am really encouraging, please, please um, join our capital campaign. Um, I want to shout out to Trustee um, Hill has done a brilliant job about the um, fair at, at the Air Zoo, but a program that I think that I'd really like to champion along with, with cosmetology and barbering and, and, and um, uh, uh, medicine was a, another one that was very popular is the audiovisual. Anything that do with Mr. Hey, you're, you, you got a lot of fans. You got a lot of fans in technology. But early middle college is something that I think we need to talk more about. It is such, it is absolutely such an opportunity for our students to get involved in this program because in five years, when you complete this program, you not only have your diploma, but on somebody else's dime, you also have your associate's degree. I can't encourage parents enough to look to, since now we're ripping off of the traditional four-year college um, avenue, and we're saying that there's more practicality to many other avenues, this is one that is, it, it can't be a well-kept secret. Its numbers should be bulging off the charts. It is a wonderful program. So I encourage any parent that has um, an eighth grader or a ninth grader to look into and see if this can accommodate or if your child wouldn't, wouldn't um, really prosper by this. And a practical aspect of this, if you graduate in five years and you have your associate, you could get a very good part-time job to support you if you're going on to subsequent certificate stacking or to another institution or whatever. It is so handy and so practical. I just can't, again, like musical, can't praise early middle college, the early middle college um, program. Shout out to counselors. Where would we be? I mean, the complexity of a high school, the complexity of the middle school, a little bit of a demonstration of the frustration of some of our students. Counselors are hugely important to the success of our students. And we've just added Four more. How many have we just added in the end this year? Four more. And again, back to my practicality about degrees, it is a very expensive degree to get. It is not the classic four year track. Becoming a school counselor, there is double student teaching. It's a very expensive degree. So I shout out to them. I shout out to their intentional listening. I shout out to them showing up every day, trying to help with whatever. Um, issues that are presented to them. So uh, in, in praise of the counselors, um, let's see, don't end my notes if there was anything else. Welcome, uh, Mr. Haight. Um, I think with that, um, I'm done. And so with that, is there, are there any other comments after I took your name? I have nothing further this evening. Thank um, you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. So we adjourn the meeting and our next meeting is Thursday, March 17th in this room at seven o'clock. Thank you so much.